Hello, Saint. You are now listening to the teaching sermon from the God Life Assembly, Joss. May you be blessed as you listen. discern his holiness. See his holiness. And then receive his holiness. Bask in that holiness. Let your confidence be renewed in his holiness. Let your heart rest in his holiness. His holy. His holiness is the foundation of his consistency. God can be trusted because he's holy. If he wasn't holy, he can't be trusted. For you to say God is holy, it means there are things you would never hear associated with God tomorrow. He doesn't change. He is what he is now. He will always be what he is. 
That's where our confidence comes from. Of all the attributes of God, his holiness is what every other thing revolves around. Lord, we stand in your holiness and we are sanctified and purified by it. We stand in your holiness and we are cleansed by it. Let your holiness be heavy on us. You know, it won't be okay that we'll just declare his holiness and not partake of it. So right now, partake of his holiness. Let his holiness remodel, rearrange your life. You are holy. You are holy. We stand in your holiness. Do you know why you always have to take off your shoes? The scripture, you know, several people met him and the command will be take off your shoes for where you stand is holy ground. It's not just because God is afraid of your shoes or your shoes will dirty his presence. No. Your shoe is a symbol of your agenda. So when you come to him, he does to you as he pleases. But your shoe also separates you from him. So you need to take it off so that you can stand and engage his holiness. Let me give you a more practical picture of what his holiness looks like. You know, when, when, you, when you come into the presence of your father, loving, caring father, it's almost natural for him to notice, you know, that there's, there's a splinter of wood in your hair and he will pull it out. He will notice, you know, that your, your powder here is too much, so he adjusts it a bit. That's what the holiness of God does to us. So I'm not in, in, a, in a hurry to run away from there because but I know that if you stand there, you know, His holiness can reach out to you and brush off that stain. Fix that crooked glass. Right? Adjust your shirt a bit because it's, it's rumpled. Thank you, Father.
We asked him. On holy ground. And we know that there are angels all around. Let us praise him. Jesus now who we are standing in his presence on holy ground Stay there. You stay there with me. There are certain things that the Lord is restoring in our modes of engagement. One of it is just the ability to stay in His presence. No, I had forgotten it, but about two weeks ago, so somehow the word just came back to me. Ah, that there was a time we used to do this thing called soaking. You know, where we just sit before the Lord. And our hearts gathered to Him. And we let that rain of his presence wash over us. And those things changed us. Right? They did. And maybe these are certain customs of his presence that that are returning. Right? Things like incense. Let's return to doing those things. This season requires it. This season requires a quietness in your soul. So don't, don't be in a hurry to Just don't be in a hurry. We are gathered here together with one agenda and it is you oh lord just one agenda and it is you oh lord we 
are gathered here together with one agenda. And need is you, oh Lord, just one agenda. And need is you, oh Lord, one agenda. And need is you, oh Lord, just one agenda. And need is you, oh, just one agenda. And need is you, oh, just one agenda. And need is you, oh, just one agenda. And it is you, oh, just one agenda. And need is you. With one agenda, and need is you, oh, with one agenda, and need is you, you're my agenda, it is you, you're my agenda, and need is you, just one agenda. And need is you, oh, just one agenda. And need is you, just one agenda. And need is you, just one agenda, oh Lord. And need you, just one agenda, oh Lord. And need is you. Just one agenda. Just one agenda. Just one agenda. Just one agenda. It is you. Just one agenda, oh Lord. You're my agenda, oh Lord. You're my agenda. Yeah. We are gathered here together with one agenda. And need is you, the one of you. And need is you. Say it again. Say we are gathered here together with one of you. And need is you, all oh one of you. And need is you, oh Lord, one agenda. Need is you, oh Lord. Need is you, oh Lord. Just one agenda, oh Lord. Need is you, oh Lord. One agenda. It is, it is you, oh, one agenda, and it is you, one agenda, it is you, just one agenda, oh, Lord, it is you, one agenda. Lord. You're my agenda, 
agenda, oh Lord. You're my agenda. Nothing else would rather do than behold you. It's the focus of our living to see you. Every time we come, it's you are excitement, you are the joy that keeps us returning, that we see you, see your ways, you know your ways, touch your grace. It's you. You are the reason why we keep coming. And tonight you are still the reason why we came. Thank you, Father. Love you, Lord. You are the object of our obsession. You are the object of our obsession. Thank you, Father. Amen. Welcome someone around you. Sit down.
Activates us. It does what? It activates us. It brings you to life in a way that many other things cannot. I was speaking somewhere recently and I and I said to them. Any environment that does not affect you and activate you is destroying you. There are no neutral environments. I hope you know that. There are no neutral environments. It's either the environment you are in is activating you or is not activating you. And say anything that does not activate you, don't waste your time with it. Amen. To gathering information, there's no end. To acquiring knowledge, there's no end. Let every effort be about knowing God. And you sit with a video and it's not activating you. Don't waste your time with it. When you're having conversations with someone and after 15 minutes you realize that that conversation is not activating you, don't waste your time with it. Don't be polite. Not with your time. Some of you don't realize that your time is your life. When we take your life and breaks it to its smallest indivisible particle, it comes to time. So whoever you give your time to, you give your life to. If I sit with you for 15 minutes, I just broke my life, a piece of it, and gave you. Don't waste your time, waste your life. With anything that does not activate you. And when I say activate you, I mean anything that does not bring you to the knowing or the knowledge of God. Amen. Everything that God wants to do in you, He has done in you. Everything God wants to give you, He has given you. Everything God wants to, wants to say to you, He has said it but it needs to be activated. Do you understand what I'm saying? The difference between your reality and what you already have is activation. Amen? Is what? Activation. You have it already. You're not, you're not trying to get it. All that pertains to life and godliness has been given to you. Right? Jesus won't die again. He has died already. And everything that his death affords you is available to you. It has been given. Sometimes that's the confusion some you know, struggle with. How do you see I have it already, but I'm not experiencing it, but I have it. That's a, that's a contradiction in terms. Yeah, That I have it, but I don't have it. <laughs> it's not a contradiction. It needs to be activated. It's sitting within you. Listen, there are parts of you you don't even know exist, but God put them there. 
He made you that way. And all that part of you is waiting for his what? Activation. An activation. An activation. And environments, environments are the best activators, right? What is the best activator? Environments. I mean it. It sounds so simple. Environments are the best activators. Samuel said to Saul, on your way back, you'll meet a company of prophets and you will prophesy. I know Saul thought he was joking. Yeah? You've read it in your Bible, so you, the story to you sounds normal. But it's not normal. For Saul. Saul didn't believe it. And when he met the company of prophets, suddenly he began to prophesy. And people began to say, ah, is Saul one of the prophets? What did the company of prophets do to him? They activated him. And all of a sudden, he began to prophesy. It was always in him. The fountain was always in him. Do you understand that? Did you understand that? It was always in him. It's always in you. All, it, all it's waiting for is the right environment. Hmm? Are you in the image and the likeness of God? Yes. So what is what are you really waiting for? Is what? Activation. Listen, you are becoming what you already. By now you should be tired of hearing me say that, right? And I'll say it till, till you know it. That you are becoming what you already what you already are. You're just being activated. Yeah? When 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 I bring an acorn, I like that example a lot because. I love the oak tree. The oak tree is very symbolic in scripture. So when I bring an acorn, an acorn is a seed of the oak tree. Yeah? Now when I, when I show you the acorn, is the acorn an oak? Is the acorn an oak? Yes. Is the acorn an oak? No. So listen, whether you say yes or no, you are absolutely right. Is the acorn an oak? Yes, you're right. Is the acorn an oak? No, you're right. <laughs> but you see, the acorn can become more an oak. Does it make sense to you? But what does it need? The right... So just keep it in a bottle, a dried bottle on your shelf, sealed. Right? Will it become more of an oak tree? It's already an oak tree, but will it become more of an oak tree? Let's, are you sure? Because let's just give it time. Let's add, let's just give it eight years. No, okay, let's make it seven. Seven is the number of perfection. Abba, by seven, something should happen to it. That's it. But the moment you take that acorn, thank you. I'll sing again, so just hold your microphone. But the moment you take that acorn and throw it into the earth, right? Now, if you throw it into the earth during dry season, will it grow? Will it grow? It will sit down there waiting. Waiting for what? Rain. The right environment. The right elements must all come together. That is its matrix. I've, I've, I've said that here before, eh? That is what? The right elements must come together. And the moment they come together, what happens? It's activated. A process begins that will transform that tiny looking powerless seed to something that winds traveling at 350 knots per hour will not be able to pull down. What made the difference? The right environment. Say with me, God is my environment. Yeah. Someone should remember culture right away, yeah? How many of you remember that? 
you remember that song? I just can't remember the song, Prophet Edem. I can't remember. Can you remember it? Sing it, sing it. Chap the jam. Okay. Where well, yo? Please hold on, hold on. Don't worry. There's a reason why you're not in the house of Judah. Edusa, come and sing it. Caleb. You are not driving cars. I need a song. I wear God. He wears me. Yeah, that's I it. I wear God. He wears me. Sing it with understanding. I wear God. Knowing that God he is your wears environment. Me. I wear God. He wears me. This is the way. God is my culture. This is the way. I live my life. <laughs> this is the life. God is my fashion. This is the way I walk around. This is the way. God is my culture. This is the way I live my life. This is the life. God is my fashion. This is the way I walk around. He wears me, I wear God, he wears me, I wear God, he wears me, I wear God, he wears me, this is the way, God is my culture, this is the way I live my life, this is the life, God is my fashion. This is the way I walk around. This is the life. God is my culture. This is the way I live my life. This is the life. God is my fashion. This is the way I walk around. This is the life. God is my culture. This is the way. There's, there's not a time you come around the presence of God. And you know when we say come around the presence of God, we're not talking about you come to church. Right? Right? The presence of God is a consciousness you wear. Right? But there's not a time you, you, come, you come around or you come in contact with the presence of God that you're not activated, that you're not changed. That's what scripture meant when he said, you know, with unveiled face, we behold as in a glass the glory of God. And we are what? Changed from... So every single time you come in contact with the countenance of God, what happens to you? You are 
changed. You have been made more into what you truly are. Right? That's the technology. It's his presence. His presence has an activating effect on us. But you see, it's not just the presence of God. It's also the presence of anyone who has been with the Lord. Does it make sense? Anyone who has been with the Lord also activates you. And already you hear First John. First John says our fellowship is not just with him, but he's also with one another. So anyone who has ever been with the Lord, when you're around them, what do they do? Their lives equally, because when they were with the Lord, they were activated and they became more like the Lord. So now they are with you. What are you now seeing in them? More like the Lord and you are becoming more like what you're seeing. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. And this is really what it means when someone says, you know, they're a worshiper. When you say you're a worshiper, you, your worshiper does not mean you're a house of Judah. Your worshiper means you, you have access to God by his spirit in truth and you partake or participate in the divine. That's what it means to be a worshiper. Amen. And every time we come, listen, every time you come and you do not consciously engage the one you have come to, there's, 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 there's what you're interacting with. What you're interacting with is just your mind, your intellect, but your heart, no, no. the eyes of your heart only sees God. Amen. Amen. So you have people who, who would come because they are not wearing the consciousness of God. They are only transacting with their minds, their intellects. So they, they can explain the sermon, but you know, it wasn't their heart that transacted with the word they heard. You see that? And we don't know God with our heads. Your head can never know God. Your mind has to be transformed. And in the transformation, it's not that it is knowing God. It's that in the transformation, it's able to interpret, decode spiritual things. Praise God. It is with the heart that we know the Lord. Tell your neighbor it's with your heart that you know the Lord. Tell the other one it's with your heart that you know the Lord. And this is really what it means to be a witness, yeah? This is really what it means to be a witness. Amen. Who is a witness? A witness is one who bears evidence that they have met with the Lord. That's all. Who is a witness? Any kind of evidence. When people meet you, is there an evidence that you are with the Lord? That's all. If you have a strand of an evidence, you are a witness. The quality of evidence you have determines the Quality of your witness. Listen, the world, the world is not going to know God by studying him. God has chosen not to be known that way. Amen? God has what? Chosen not to be known that way. And he's not going to change it. It's part of what we're saying earlier. His holiness will not allow him to change it. The holiness of God does not allow him to change his mind. <laughs> Strange, yeah? But that's a beautiful thing about the holiness of God. The holiness of God means he's set apart for his cause. You will never catch him doing anything outside of what he has proposed to do. His holiness won't let him do it. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's the holiness of God. He is consecrated. You know, you know the moment the moment you in, in the Old Testament there are three elements that are that are that are consecrated or anointed. Yeah, four. Right? The priest is anointed, the king is anointed, the prophet is anointed, and the utensils of service in the temple, they are also anointed. Right? So the moment you carry the bowl from your house, it's still your bowl. You can do whatever you want with your bowl. You can use it to wash beans. Use it to wash rice. You can use it to, you know. But the moment 
that bowl is anointed, what happens? It becomes holy unto the Lord. It means you can no longer use it for anything else but for God. Does it make sense to you? So when a man says I'm anointed, he's not just talking about how powerful he is. Is that the first principle is that he is separate. Is why God concent concentrates the energies of his powers in the man. Because the man has separated himself from doing anything else but the will of the Lord. Does that make sense to you? And let me tell you, let me tell you. If you wake up today and say, Lord, what's your will? That's all I want to do with my life. The moment you do that, the anointing on your life multiplies. I'm trying to say it in English. Do you understand? Does it make sense to you? Why? Because the moment you say that, what are you saying? I am holy unto the Lord. And because you are holy unto the Lord, God is desperately, God, see, let me tell you, God wants to be known. Doesn't that sound like a contradiction? Yeah? That God wants to be known. How many of us feel to a very great extent that God doesn't want to be known? God likes to play hide and seek. Have you felt that way before? Yeah. How many of us feel like, you know, but, but, I, I can't remember where I was saying it. I think it was in, it was in advanced Bible class. I was saying to them how, you know, and I, I think I've said it here before. It's a very simple statement, but I feel like I can be a better God than God, yeah? Have you felt that way before? You haven't? Oh, man, I, I feel like, you know, man, God, God can be slow sometimes, yeah? I wish he can speed things up. I don't understand why you sit down in heaven with all those powers and you are saying, let my kingdom come. Did <laughs> you? Wait, really? Does that make sense to you? No, really? Does it make sense to you? You are sitting in heaven. You created everything. You own it. With all these powers. You are sitting on a ton of power that eternity cannot comprehend. And yet you are saying, let my will be done. Let. Let. Do, do, do you know what it means to... I, I, yeah, you see, I've told the Lord plainly in English. I told him, if you give me God for 24 hours, you'll be, you will be impressed. When you come back and collect the universe, you'll be like, Man, I never knew this was possible. <laughs> and see, I'm not even asking him to give me all his powers. Just <laughs> He should just give me like three of his powers. I don't want seven. I want to use those three. God will, God will look at me and say, man, I never knew this was possible. <laughs> right? I mean, what kind of a God is that? He will sit there, Pastor Rampi, and he's wishing when he can just do it. First, his holiness is what won't let him. Do you understand that? The holiness of God makes God stick to his plan. See, God has an eternal counsel. And the eternal counsel is that he wants sons. Does it make sense to you? Does, does that statement make sense to you? And he has sworn that he must get sons. His holiness will not make him wake up tomorrow and say, you know what, <laughs> these guys, they, um, they, they ain't getting it. So I will just... Let's just close this chapter and he let us face. No, his holiness won't let him do that. Amen. Yes, he won sons, but There's a way he has chosen to be made manifest. And it's through who? First is how and then through. See, if God is ever going to be known on the earth, right? Right? It's going to be his sons. Does it make sense? Listen, if God will ever be known on the earth, 
is going to be his sons that will make him known. He can, be, he can break through the sky now and hang over the sky and speak with a thunder that everywhere you are on planet earth, you hear it. Every fiber and cell of your body will, will tremble at the sound of that voice. And God will say, <laughs> he doesn't need to say much. <laughs> he just needs to say, I am. Right? And he returns. We woke up tomorrow morning. How many? Uh, September we said project. How many people? One. You don't need to cough. See, in every church there will be crossover night. We do. It will be New Year. Does, does it make sense to you? The churches, every creature. I mean, atheists. Everybody that is that atheists. All those liars. Because uh, atheists are just deceiving themselves. And I don't say that callously. I don't say that without consideration. I understand what that means. And yet, I'm just saying what the Bible says. Before anyone can say there's no God, he has to be a fool. Yeah? Yeah? Amen? He has to be a fool. He's, there's, there's, there's no way around it. All of a sudden, every 80s realized that they were never 80s before. They, 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 they knew God. Everything about them knew God. You, see, they, you always know your maker when your maker shows up. That doesn't make sense. And yet God is not doing that. Don't you used to wonder why he's not doing that? And he's saying that is you. He wants you, you to manifest him to the world. And I was actually talking about a witness. Who is a witness? A witness is anyone, anyone, anyone who has met the Lord and carries an evidence. Amen. Carries what? An evidence. This scripture, this scripture baffles me. Let me quote it again. Acts chapter 1, verse 6 to 8, right? Acts chapter 1, verse 6 to 8, Jesus said, the disciples of Jesus came to him and said, Lord, will you at this hour take power? Right? Will you at this hour take power? And really in that question, you, you get to realize that as much as they followed him, it was not the type of Christ they expected. Amen? Amen? Because, I mean, Nobody expected that kind of a Christ, yeah? Nobody did. That kind of a Christ is too, is too weak a Christ. Doesn't it feel that way? Doesn't it feel that way? It's too weak a Christ. Hmm? The, the, the Jews were waiting for the Messiah. The Messiah is the title of Savior. Do you understand that? Do you understand that? They were waiting for a Joshua, because Yeshua is Joshua. So they were waiting for a Joshua that is greater than David. I want you to combine those two in one person. Yeah? Who was Joshua? Joshua was the person that, that gave them the promised land. Right? Joshua was that warrior that, I mean, when he fought, he fought a particular war and the sun stood still. That's the kind of warrior Joshua was. Joshua settled the clans in their different lands. He gave them lands. Joshua fought with giants, Og, right? Sihon, those people, they were, their beds was nine feet, ten feet tall. They had six fingers. Not like you. You have five fingers. Those, those, they had six. They needed an extra finger for balance. Their massiveness. Five fingers cannot balance them on the ground. They were the sons of the Nephilim. Do, do you remember when, when they returned from scouting the land of Jericho? And it says, the Nephilim, the sons of the Nephilim live there. We are not able. Joshua said, no, we're able. Let's go. Joshua and Caleb said, we're able. That was Joshua. Joshua did all of that. And they're left with a promise that their Messiah is going to come. 
And when he comes, he will be greater than David. He will sit on the throne of David. David was such a powerful king that if David meets your army, your army needs 60 years to recover its military strength. Does that, do you understand that? You need 60 years to recover your military strength. Because when you meet David and his mighty men, they, they decimate, they don't destroy. They Decimation is not, it's not destruction. You have to go back and grow little children. <laughs> do you understand that? You have to go back and grow little, little children until they become an army. How many years is going? So from, there's no conquest. You return humble. David was so successful that Solomon ruled for close to 40 years and he never fought one because of what David did. I mean, the mention of Solomon, son of David, made that kings just contributed their wives. You know what? We want eternal peace with you. Come and take our wives. This is a sign and a seal that we will never fight you. We can't. How can we fight our in-laws? There's nothing to fight. And Samuel will prophesy to David. That the Messiah is coming, your son, he'll be greater than you. Is that David? So they are seeing Joshua and David in one creature. Then Jesus showed up. Right? Moving about with 12 rascals. Rascals that didn't even qualify for any rabbi to collect them. So they went to becoming fishermen and... Because it's the brightest minds that the rabbis collect. That's the law of discipleship. From six, you are a Talmudian. So you learn, you learn. By the time you get to age 14, 15, 16, then you go to the market square. So you display your knowledge of scriptures. Then the rabbi will look at you and say, you have potential. I pick you, I pick you. The ones that are left, not picked, they go and continue family trade. Then Jesus showed up. He said, where are those traders? They are the ones I'm looking for. Where are the ones that failed to qualify? They are the ones I'm looking for. That's why they were called unlearned men. Do you understand that? Do you understand that? When, when, when the Bible says unlearned, it's not saying they cannot read or write. No. That's not what the Bible is saying. A learned person is the one that a rabbi collects and then trains in the law. Then Jesus showed up. He said, he said, he said, if they slap you here, you should, son of David, no, that's an insult to your heritage. No, no, no. You, you don't understand it, right? It's not offending you, but it offended them all. It offended them so badly that it was the reason why they killed him. Go back and read all the inter interrogations of Jesus in the book of John. Every time they were interrogating him, the first question, you say you are the, are you the king of the Jews? That's the question. You are confusing us. You can't show up and say, love your neighbor. What's, what's love? David, David was not a preacher of love. David was the war. <laughs> See, when David pass, he, when he passes through your land, have you read the description of his mighty men? And David goes to war with all of them. It's not that he keeps some as spare at home. He goes to war with all of them. One man that can bring down 3,000 men, another 800 men. One is snowing, ice. No, you don't read the details. So when you read, in a snowy day, he went into a pit and killed a bear, a lion. You, you think, your problem is that you are Africans. You have never tried to fight on snow. So I want you to imagine you fighting on ice. And you are fighting a bear on ice. Those are the kind of men who, then Jesus showed up. David had people that will use sword, bring down 800 men. 
Jesus went to carry people that Some of, you, some of you are not seeing the picture. Is the reason why? Because even the Pharisees felt insulted, right? If you are going to be David, you will surround yourself with people like us. But look at the things you... you they, they made him lose credibility. And the worst was they were always fighting among themselves. Zero ministry ethics. When they pass through your farm, they'll break, break your corn. I mean, what? <laughs> the way they pass through your farm, they'll break, break your, and they'll be eating the rock, rock corn. Rock corn. And those are supposed to be the mighty men. You know, there's something, there's something Pastor used to say a while back. He said, most of you seated here, you are shouting you love Jesus. If you were in the day that Jesus lived, you probably will not be his disciple. He would probably be too classless for you. It really didn't make any... He, just listen, some of you think Jesus was... Jesus made it hard for people to believe in him. It was deliberate. In the book of John, he got up, John chapter 6, he said to them, if you to have eternal life, eat my flesh, drink my blood. The Bible says all of them were offended and they left him. And the Bible said, added, that for all of them that left, they never returned. So Jesus had disciples that started following him. They were offended at him. They left. He never returned. And he didn't do follow up. Man, watch. What he did to the remaining that stayed, he turned and said to them, what about you? You will not go. Won't you leave? Listen, that's not how to be Christ. I think if you want to be Christ, there's a way to be Christ. He should come to our century and we teach him how to be Christ. When we give him the Cadillac of chariots. <laughs> hey. When we package him. When we are done, the world will believe him. <laughs> oh God. Preach, 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 preach with those keys, brother. It's part of packaging. You are know? not hearing anything. Oh, then you're like, goosebumps. <laughs> Goose goosebumps is not spirit. Goosebumps is one hormone. <laughs> I felt goosebumps. You are not in the spirit, brother. You are in your hormones. Jesus made it hard for them to believe him. He kept the wrong associations. Do you understand? The, do you know that he was called a friend of sinners? And it, it was one of the things that offended the Pharisees the more. And Jesus said to them, you see, the problem is, who needs a doctor? <laughs> We're here talking about Christ. You're talking about doctor. Can you see his problem? His problem was that he never really understood ministry. That was Jesus' problem. He never understood ministry. And listen, listen, Jonah had the same problem with God. Jonah looked at God. He said, God, you don't understand ministry. And this is the problem. You say to me, go and tell them they will die. I need to go and tell them they will die. And not after I finish telling them they will die, then they die. Then everybody will know that you are. That's how to do ministry. He says, but I know you. When I go and tell them they will die, then they will cry. Then you say you change your mind. Then they will say he's lying. I said, please, if that's the kind of ministry you want to do, <laughs> I'm on my way to Tashish. 
I'm on my way to Tashish. That was, that was Jonah's accusation against God. You don't know. You're not ready. Whenever you're ready to do real ministry, call me. <laughs> but for now, I'm on my way to Tashish. You, 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 are not, you are not serious about making a name for yourself. And at the end of the day, who ends up looking like a fool? Me. Because I said it, it didn't come to pass. Then someone will be passing tomorrow. <laughs> That's the guy. He brought word that did not come to pass. <laughs> Jonah said, I can't have that on my resume. Are you seeing that? I can't have that on my record. If we have our ways, we'll teach the Lord how to do ministry. We'll teach God, teach God how to be God. <laughs> Amen. You know, most especially us Africans. Africans will be better gods than every other, every other ethnic group. We, we, we love the pomp and pride of the spotlight. We love positions of power. And it's part of our psyche. It's part of our culture. And we need to know it, right? We need to have very proper talks. We need to sit around the table ourselves and ask ourselves what, what, why we are the way we are. We are allowed to be Africans, but we are not allowed to have the mind of Africans. We have to have the mind of Christ. We are allowed to be black men, but we are not allowed to think like we must have the mind of Christ. And to a great extent, I wonder whether, whether the gospel we have received is incapable of really truly transforming our minds. Because, you know, we still behave like Africans. Just, you know, blood-washed Africans, but still <laughs> Africans. It was T.D. Jakes that used to say, if you're a sinner and get baptized in water, you're just a dry sinner that went in and came out a wet sinner. <laughs> Doesn't change anything. Are, are you with me? L loosen up a bit, all right? Some of you are waiting for when I will start. Your, 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 your problems are many. Yeah. Your condition is called uptightness. Amen. And we have, we have Pastor Teaser in the house. I was looking for a right opportunity to stop and acknowledge you. Thank you, sir. God bless you. And we have many servants of God in the house. Can you celebrate all of them? And we have you in the house. <laughs> you made it. <laughs> Hallelujah. We don't like sometimes the forms that God chooses to take. That's, that's all I'm saying. And we wish, you know, he will do better. Right? And so the disciples of Jesus came to him, Pastor Rampi, in Acts chapter 1 verse 6. They said, will you at this time take power? What are they saying? That even though, you know, they stood you know, in Matthew 16 and he asked them, who do men say? I am. And Peter even said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And what did he say? Flesh and blood did not reveal it to you, but my father in heaven. And you will think it has settled it, that they know. He said, well, what about you? Won't you go away? He said, no, 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 we can't go anywhere. We have discerned that you have the words of life. So we will stick with you, right? But the problem was, somewhere in their minds, they knew he was the Christ, but this was the narrative Pastor Rampi they created, is that he's the Christ and he's just 
hiding it. His moment of power is coming. So it's why they will ask him, you know, Lord, your kingdom, what's, what's going to happen in your kingdom? I mean, the wife of Zebedee came and said, in your kingdom, when we arrive at the hour of power, grant that my two sons, one will sit at your left and at your right. Jesus didn't stop to correct her and say to her, no, 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 this is all there is to me. Oh. <laughs> he didn't say to her, you know what, I'm even going to complicate things. I'll die. Do you understand why when he said he would die, Peter said, I can't have this. Because, I mean, it didn't make sense, right, to them that... Do you remember the conversation on the road to Emmaus? What were they saying? We actually thought he was the Christ, though. And now he's... <laughs> then he showed up and said to them, you idiots, literally. Okay, literally, right? Was that not what he said to them? What did he say to them? He said to them, you fools. The tone was strange. Is it not plain from scripture that the son of man will come and he will die? The Bible said he explained to them and they said, ah, then. So it means that even those his disciples that had been with him so tight and so close, didn't expect that. When he's res resurrected, Thomas said, I need proof. He didn't believe it. So after he resurrected, before he died, they said, this is strange. When he died, they said, it has finished. We are hopeless. When he resurrected, they said, we're still in game. Does it make sense to you? So we are still in play. The game is still on. They went fishing when they saw that he was alive. They said, ha, 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 ha. Okay. You, you know, this makes it more, this adds a twist to the story. What's the twist? Imagine a son of David that died and came back to life. Imagine our king who sits on the throne has come back to life from the dead. By, by all means, it means he is on Killable. Imagine someone on Killable leading us on a chariot into war. What nation on earth will stand before us? That was what they were seeing. So they came to him and said, will you at this time take... No, I'm showing you that the question we were asking was in Acts chapter 1. So he told you that, he tells you that up until that time, they still were believing that he was going to stop and say, you know what? <laughs> Tada! It's time. Tundama, I just wanted to see those who truly believe in me. Then he would turn and say, those of you, these 12 that believe in me, <laughs> you are now my generals. Take your portion. Take your portion. You, I give you from, from the Mediterranean, <laughs> all the way. They said, you, I give you. That was what they were expecting. Oh. I'm telling you. Oh, you didn't know? Because that was what their question was asking. It says, will you at this time take power? And this is how Nigerian films are. Is, is that not... You know, the prince would go, then he would hide himself, then he would tell the girl. He wouldn't tell her that he's the prince. Then one day, she says, she says um, um, Chinom, so I'm coming. Then he would just come. Then they open, then you see him in his princely. Then it would be like, gong, gong. Then you see the music, play the proper one. You, you, uh -huh, you, You qualify to start doing scores for Nollywood. Pastor Ahide, you can recommend him. <laughs> Praise God. And that, that's, that's, that's the theme of Nigeria. Then everybody will say, ah. Then she'll be like, I never knew. Then he'll just stand. Yeah, <laughs> I'm the one. Then all of you that watch, you'll be smiling, 
like, oh, ha, 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 this is it. This, I mean, I wish I would just wake up tomorrow and someone would tell me that I inherited eight billion that, is, that one unknown uncle left for me. All your uncles are known. <laughs> We have the addresses. <laughs> That's the problem. All your uncles are known. <laughs> you know, vanity can be. Vain imagination is powerful. <laughs> Someone will sit down imagining. That let, let my phone just ring now. <laughs> Tell me, are you Oriolua James? <laughs> Yeah, yes, Amor. Um, you need to come to our head office. <laughs> and then as you are dreaming it, the, in the day or not at night, as you are dreaming it, you are now smiling, you are feeling good. Right after you are done imagining, you pick up your phone to call your cousin. Then you hear, your account balance. <laughs> that, is it sufficient? <laughs> that, that woman can remind you about things you know. One day I was dying, I said, stop reminding me about what I know. I said, I know already, it's my phone. I know that my account balance is low. Praise God. We like it. We don't like to be shrouded in mystery and humility. We like to be seen. And it, it's not bad. It's actually the language of glory. It is encoded in all of us. But listen, this age is not the age of glory. No, not this age. Your true age of glory is the age to come. That's when you will know what glory is like. Whatever glory you see now is nothing compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. Listen, certainly there's an age to come and that age will be the age of glory. It's not this age. This age is the age of fire. It's the age of what? But you see, even in the fire, right? We can walk in it with our garments not smelling like smoke, even in the fire. But this is the age of fire. There's, there's no glory you would have in this age that will match the, the one that is to come. No. So wait. Live the life that permits you expand and enter into more glory in the age to come. Are you with me tonight? And when they asked him, he said, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Yes, he says, will you at this time take power? Because when they, when they, next verse, he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the father had put in his own power. Have you noticed that every time they talk about the kingdom, this was Jesus' response. When the wife of Zebedee came, what did he say to her? No one knows except the same answer. Then listen to verse 8. What did he say? What did he say in verse 8? But you shall receive Wow. Right? They were asking for power and he agreed to give them power. What's the difference? What's the difference? <laughs> Take. That's the first difference. What's the first difference? Take. Listen. God is not going to Take power. Man. His power must be revealed. 
made manifest. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? And listen, God can take power. Take power means to use force. Can we, can we leave it like that? Simple. Take power means use force. God is not going to use force. What is he going to use? Listen to what he said. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be what? Witnesses. Witnesses. What's the word there? Witnesses. And you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Andrew, you either take power or leave out power. Which one did Jesus give them? Leave it out. That's what a witness is. A witness is someone who has met the Lord. And it is the Lord he has met that he gives another. Did you hear what I just said? Do you hear what we just said? What is it that God wants you to share? What you have found in him. That's all. <laughs> hey. How is the Lord going to take the world? He's going to take the world by his people knowing him and sharing that life with the world. That's the only way God has sworn by his eternal counsel to take the world. Are you following me? Did you follow what I just said? This is this is this is Apostle Moses' son, right? Right? And then let's say tomorrow you find Apostle Moses' son with another boy of his age fighting. Amen. Now can Apostle Moses beat that boy? Can he beat him? If he decides to beat him, can he beat him? Can he even kill him? Does he even need to exert so much effort to beat him? He doesn't. And yet, there's an eternal counsel in Apostle Moses that says, I will never be the one to beat him. I can go to the moon and back cross 8,000 oceans to teach you, train you, give you whatever it takes. But if there's anyone that will beat that boy, it has to be you. That's God's eternal counsel. Why? If the Lord does it for you, he has taken your glory. Why is Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father, waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool? After he has successfully defeated all of them. Why? Because he wants you to deal the final blow so that his bride, just like him, can have a glory even in eternity to say, We did it together. Do you understand that? The eternal counsel of God will never allow Apostle Moses to get up and say, you know what, let me just end it. Let me just beat this boy for you. 
He's not going to do it. But if it requires him to travel, to trek to China, to get a, to get a Shaolin monk, on his way, then he will stop at Tibet and get another, you know, and on his, he, then he stops. He, he, if he's going to carry jiu-jitsu, karate, mix all of them and bring oil, oh yeah, train this boy, wake up every morning, drill him. He must return to his enemy and win him. He will do it, but he will never fight the battle. That's God's eternal counsel. It's sitting in Ephesians chapter 1. What is God's intent in his counsel? I want sons. Son is the one that qualifies to represent you. So that you don't have to be there. And until God has that, Pastor Rampi, there's nothing that will make God ever settle to do it himself. I said it, I said it this way in the advanced Bible class. If it takes a million years for sons to come out of the earth, God will wait. He and the Holy Ghost will wait. They will keep laboring, prodding hearts, teaching, instructing, laboring until sons in the image of Christ arise. One day, the earth will see it. Human beings that are not Jesus, exactly like Christ walking the earth. It's the only way the earth will end. The earth is not going to end because God is tired of waiting. So you just fold things up. The earth is not going to end because God is angry that there is so much darkness in the world. No, it is darkness like Pastor Rampi. Let this darkness multiply times a million. The Holy Ghost will brood in it till he births sons. That's God's eternal counsel. And he will never interfere. Because to interfere means he has taken the glory and the divinity of his sons. Through eternity they cannot be called gods anymore if their father fights their battles. So he finishes it. Do you know what it means to finish it, Pastor Rampi? Is that everything you will ever need to succeed at it, your father prepares. That's exactly what David did. Solomon didn't need one, one ounce of gold to build the temple. His father provided everything. That's the order of God. That's why the Holy Ghost is here. What's his job? Walking. Walking. Sons must be born. And if you live your life, perhaps you never saw it. You will join the cloud of witnesses. Because the witness was everyone. Whoever became the conduit that met God and displayed God to another. That's a witness. You will join them in waiting for the day. The Bible says, day without us are not complete. Not perfect. And everyone who has this hope in him. In the day of the perfection, they will be gathered from wherever they are and brought to the finish line to lead the procession into victory. So even if you never saw it in your day, insist that I, I must live. And you shall receive what? Power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon. And you shall be what? Witnesses unto me. To the uttermost parts of the earth. The manifestation of God's power is in a creature called a witness. If God wants to show his power, what does he release? The witness. Ha <laughs> ha. Witnesses don't look, they don't look like much. They don't, they may not look like much. 
yet. There's something they have seen and heard. There's something they have handled that they must communicate. Is anyone still with me? So the Bible said that the gospel of the kingdom must be preached as a witness to the uttermost ends of the earth. Which means the gospel of the kingdom is not to be preached as a sermon. We have many sermons on the kingdom. And if there's anything a sermon will do, is to arrange you. But the gospel of the kingdom is not preached by sermons. It's preached by witnesses. A manner of living. Not a manner of talking. If you read Revelation chapter 11, from verse 1 all the way, like, that's it. That's in Matthew 24 verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. How? For a witness unto all nations. And then the end will come. Let's not mistake the gospel of the kingdom for a message. It's not a sermon. It's not a, we can do series on the kingdom. Yes, sir? Series, kingdom, part one, part two, part three, part eight. Still not the kingdom. Because the kingdom is what? Is when witnesses are unleashed. When they live in the earth. The response they cause out of the earth. That's what kingdom is. <laughs> in Revelation 11. Chapter 1 from verse 1 to verse 14. You will find scripture describes these two witnesses. Right? These two crazy witnesses. <laughs> then 11 verse 15. Now says to you. And after the witnesses were done. With all the, I'm not, I'm not going into that. After they were done with all that they were doing, right? Then the Bible says, and the seventh angel sounded. And there were great voices in heaven saying, the of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign for right after the witnesses finished their job. Not before. This declaration can only come <laughs> when witnesses walk the earth. Listen, and a witness is not one who comes to church. No, no, no. A witness is one who has met the Lord and has chosen to bear upon himself the evidence of his encounter. And live his everyday life upon that evidence. Leaning upon his staff. That's a witness. Let them know that I met with you. There's a song like that. Yeah? Have, you, have you heard that song? It was K-Strings that sang it. Yes. Right? You've not heard that song before? <laughs> Ooh. We must go beyond our Let's seek an evidence. And what's the evidence? It's just to know the Lord. Not that you have knowledge of the Lord, Andrew. Right? It's not just that you know, have knowledge about the Lord. But that you have knowledge of the Lord. That you know him. 
Paul said that I might know him. Made conformable unto his death. Paul said, I, I know I've, I've attained many things. See, but I've chosen right now to forget all that and what press on for the mark. And then he stopped and said that I might know him. Amen. And that's really what an activation is about, right? That's what an activation is. That somehow you, you, you stay, you abide, right? You stay sufficient enough for God to leave his mark on you. To do what? To stay sufficient enough for God to leave his mark on you. You know this, there's, there's this concept of sufficient response that to a great extent I feel we trivialize and maybe to an extent we don't understand. And you know, maybe one day we will, we will, we will, we will, we will, we will look at it. The, the, the Bible talks about concepts like in the fullness of time. Yeah? In the fullness of time. Hmm? In the fullness of time. Hebrews talks about the full assurance of faith. The what? Full assurance of faith. Fullness. There's, there's this, you know, fullness. To be full of the Spirit, yeah? To be what? Full of the... It's not the same thing as having the Holy Ghost. Does it make sense to you? Does it make sense to you? It's, it's not the same. To be filled with you. Changes everything. The thing is we have you, but we're not filled with you. So fill us over. Till we flow over. Over the church into the world where I almost need. So fill us over. Till we flow over. Over the church into the world where I almost need to be filled with you changes everything. The thing is, we have you, but we're not filled with you. So fill us all. You see that concept, Pastor Rampi, about to be filled. When 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 you're not filled. It means there's still a part of you that is you. That's the part of you that still has sense. When someone drinks, do you remember, you know, on Sunday, right? Pastor Sarah talked about the line. Do you remember that example about drinking, right? Do you remember that example? After the first cup, was the person drunk? Right? The person can even say, you know, I'm all right. I'm okay. I'm, I mean, I still see the road clearly the way I ought to see. Did you get it? I'm, I'm perfectly all right. I, I, I don't, not, nothing's wrong. I, I can take another and then takes another and they're still okay. Right? They don't just know at what point exactly where they cross the line, but there's a crossing of the line at some point. And when they cross the line, that's when they are now taking over. At first, they were in control. 
When they took the first glass, they were still in. The second one, they were still in control. At some point that nobody knows, the other takes control. <laughs> At some point that nobody can really pinpoint and say at this point, but the other takes over. There, there was a particular camp meeting where Baba came and, and talked to us about this. Right? The, the, the switch. The switch. At what point does the switch happen? Is a North African tribe that has the ritual. And when they come, they gather around the fire, right? They gather around very huge bonfires. Pastor Hidi, and they gather, they, they begin to chant the song of their gods. And then they are dancing around this fire. And they are dancing around this fire. And the young men will begin to circle around this fire. And they are dancing. And they are singing, ole, 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 ole. Yeah, you get it? That ole, ole, yeah? It's actually a ritual, the song of a ritual. It's an invitation for another to take over. Do you know why they use it in football? When they see a footballer exhibit a skill that is kai, that thing is divine, it's not human. They begin to chant, there's someone else playing with him. So as they are dancing, they are singing ole, ole, ole around the fire. At some point, the switch happens. No one knows exactly what point, but when the switch happens, those young men that are dancing around the fire, they now jump into the fire and they are never burned. And they don't know what's happening to them. Another has taken over. Literally, even their bodies becomes divine. They will dance in the fire, dance in the fire for hours and they will come out. Not a blister from heat on their toes, their feet. Not a burn on their body. It's demons, these pure demons. Raw demons. Pastor Rampi, when you took the first two glasses, you were still in charge. You can still say, I want to go here. But you know, when another takes over, you are now drunk. Does it make sense? When you are not drunk, who is the governor? The wine is the governor. It's the wine that will tell you, let's turn right. As you are walking, the wine tells you, turn right. Then you, the, wine says, <laughs> the wine says, you are too fast. <laughs> slow down, then you slow down. Then the wine says, I think you should take two steps backward. Okay. <laughs> do, do you see why they do that? It's not because they are mad. They are not mad. They have a new governor. And the governor knows exactly what he's looking for. And what's the intent of the governor? To make them a mocking stock. Do you know what? That's what the Bible says. Wine is a mocker. So when you drink wine, what does wine do? Is the reason why when they are doing that, then a small boy, that on a normal day when your eyes are clear, has no right to point his finger at you and laugh. That boy will point his finger at you. <laughs> See, babang. I don't want to call somebody. <laughs> See, babang. Kabiru. At least I don't know any Kabiru. And then they will laugh. What has the wine? Has the wine succeeded? Exactly. Because the intent of the wine is to make you mock her. Anyone who gets carried away by it, when you pass in your street, people will turn and mock a little. That's what wine does to you. But when we are taken over by the Holy Ghost, sir, scripture says that we can be drunk. Hi. It says, do not be drunk with wine. Wherein is excess. But be filled. It's not just have the Holy Spirit. It's be let there be an evidence that someone else is governor. And listen, sir, when someone else is governor, we can see it. You don't have sense. It's why you can sit with someone and say, you know what, I'm thinking of doing a crusade in 
And what you have in your account is 2,863 naira. Waiting for GT to remove their... The kind of things I've seen with GT. God. Is well. Does anyone understand what I just said? It's why you can sit down and you are mad. Why? Because uh, another is governor. It's why you can walk on the street and you see a madman. And you tell, wait, wait for me, I'm coming. And you walk up to the madman. And lay hands on the madman. And start to pray. It's because you yourself are... Listen, it's only madmen that can do everything scripture recommends without question. Scriptural recommendations are for madmen only. There are many things in the Bible you cannot do until you are mad. They slap you here, turn the... Only madmen do that. Anyone that has his sense. Do you understand that when you truly sit down? Do you know that most times it doesn't pain at that moment? Do you know? Do you know that when you sit down and start to think about it? Wait. <laughs> but wait, oh. <laughs> wait, oh. I mean, you mean this? Like, so, you mean, Jennifer looked at me and she carried her hand. Of course, what else was she going to use? And she slapped me. 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 You see, why? It's because you are reasonable. You are what? reasonable. The kingdom is for unreasonable men. The kingdom is for what? Unreasonable men. So, so you, you get it when I say being feel. You, you see? Ah. There's a beautiful story in scripture. I think First Kings, I, I want to believe. Is it First Kings or Samuel? Second Samuel? I think First Kings. First Kings. This king, sir, Jehoash, he went to the man, Elisha. And the Bible said Elisha was lying in his sick bed, right? Ready to die. He was about to die. The Bible clearly said that it was that sickness that was going to kill him. Then Jehoash went to him and said, sir, I have. <laughs> He went and lay, ho lay hold of him and said, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. He made that proclamation. Every time you see that proclamation in scripture, it's a summon of the kings, past and present. And he stood there and he said, um, What is going to become of me after you have gone? You are the light of Israel. How can I be king without you, O Samuel? I'm paraphrasing now. You won't see that in the Bible. But that was the conversation that happened. And look at the Assyrians. The Assyrians are not becoming any weaker. And just in case, if you're a student of history, you will know that the Assyrians are the most brutal nations that ever lived. Compared to Rome, Assyrians were learning work. You understand? The Romans, sorry, were learning work compared to the Assyrians. The Assyrians were so brutal a nation, Pastor Haidi, that the Lord had to wipe them off the earth. Completely. There's no trace of Assyria. It's only in the Bible you see Assyria. You can go, you can go now and find where Babylon is, right? It's Iraq, you know. You can go and find where Persia is. It's Iran, you know. There's no place on earth you go and say, this is Assyria. It doesn't exist. The Lord wiped it out. Because of how brutal they are. Literally, there's no geographical region now. When you see Assyria, it's only in the Bible. There's no nation you can go now and say, oh, it is this modern nation. It was ancient Assyria. No. Iraq is Babylon. Iran is Persia. Right? You know Greece. You know Rome. Assyria doesn't exist. No geographical territory called Assyria. That's how brutal they were. And after he cried to, to some to, to Elisha. Elisha said, um, take your bow, take, take some arrows. He said, stand at the window and do what? So he drew and he shot. And he said, so, take the arrows and strike the ground. And then he took the arrows and he struck the ground. One. Two. Three. Then he 
he stopped. Then Elijah got mad. Why will you stop? No, no, no. Some of these stories, don't they bother your times? I mean, I read these things critically, right? I read it, you know, like, okay, I don't get what's happening. Why didn't you just tell me from the get-go, right? As many times as you can. Why would you let me just... And then after I three times, then you start shouting. Are you okay? Why do you... You just like to shout. All these prophetic people. You just like drama. <laughs> Elisha said, if you had only stricken the ground five times, you would have had... You would have been the one to have ended Assyria for... Ever is the kind of victory that Assyria can never recover. So, but because you did it three times, you would have victory over them three times. And after three times, that's all. We go back to level playing. <laughs> if you are strong, you will win. If they are strong, what's the mystery of the five strikes? What's the mystery of the five strikes? Pastor Rampi, why is it that why is it that when Elisha, when Elijah put his head between his knees and began to pray, what's the mystery of praying, then checking, and returning to pray again? What's the mystery of praying seven times? This, this Assyrian general will come to Elisha said, I want to be healed. And Elisha will say, go to, go, to, go to the river Jordan and dip yourself. How many times? Seven times. And he was vexed. He said, are there no better rivers you're coming from? Can, can you imagine this man? Prophetic people. <laughs> they like <laughs> they like drama. You will like drama too much. Is anyone, is anyone getting blessed? I know I'm not shouting. Yeah? <laughs> Thank you, Ma. You said it all. <laughs> Amen. And when he finally agreed to do it, after his servants com convinced him to do it, you know what, just do it. Just obey the man. At the end of the day, you know, even if you don't get... I mean, I, I, I bathe in better rivers, for heaven's sake. What's this dirty Jordan? Jordan is nothing compared to the rivers I've seen where I'm coming from. But after they convinced him and he entered the river, he dipped himself the first time. Question, was he healed? He dipped himself the second time. Was he healed? The third time. Was he healed? Okay, the sixth time. Was he healed? What if he decided to walk away after the sixth time? Will he be healed? The Bible talks about full assurance of faith. Listen, I know you have faith, but let your faith be ish. I know you have faith, but let it feed a little bit more. Do you understand? Listen. When the cloud is full, it will empty itself. Simple. When the cloud is full, it will empty itself. If you are not yet seeing it, it's because it is not yet. Because when the cloud is full, it will empty itself. Simple. So when you are not yet seeing it, what should you do? What should you do? 
Now, pastor taught us about while we wait, we sow. We keep sowing. While we wait, we keep sowing. Why? If it's not yet emptying itself, it's because it's not yet full. So keep adding. Keep believing. Do you know, Pastor Aide, patience does something interesting in the Bible. Patience, patience, patience has a very, very, very funny attitude, right? Patience wants perfection from us. Patience demands perfection. Patience has a nag for perfection. Every time patience looks at a person, patience wants the person perfect. That's one of the characters or attributes of patience in the Bible. So every time patience looks at a person and patience sees any tinge of imperfection, patience would jump in and interrupt the promise That's what patience does. Patience would interrupt the promise. Set the promise on delay. Then go to work. Listen. So there's no time God makes an actual promise that the delay is actually delayed. Did anyone get what I just said? Let me say it in another way. There is no delay in your life that does not have his reasons. You may not know it, but patience knows it. Actually, patience does not only know it, patience costs it. And patience costs the delay because patience needs to work. Patience cannot bear imperfection. Patience was created so that perfection can come out. When God was creating patience. God said to patience, you have one job. Delay me so that they can be perfect. Aye. Did anybody get that? When God looked at himself and created the virtue patience, God said to himself, there's only one job you have. They have to be perfect. I am perfect. I don't have the endurance for imperfection. So I'm creating you to come in between me, my perfection and their imperfection. At all costs, do whatever you can to make sure that my perfection does not swallow their imperfection. So the only way patience does it is to delay the coming of God so that the Lord can perfect you. This is what I'm saying. Literally, if it was God, Pastor Rampi, if God says to you, let me use a very mundane example. If God says to you, I'll give you one billion now. Do you think that is hard for God to do? <laughs> it's not mundane. One billion is not mundane. Yeah, it's kingdom. It's for, it's for kingdom. <laughs> Forgive Pastor Rampi. So, if the Lord says, I will give you one billion right now, is it because the Lord doesn't have it? Does the, can the Lord do it now? With the Lord, are there instant miracles? The instantness of the miracle, is it because of, because if, if the miracle is not instant, is it because of insufficiency? No. Never. Never. So, what I'm saying is, if you have confirmed that it was the Lord that said it, it can happen when? Now. Right? Actually, let's say it this way. If it is the Lord that said it, it happens when? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not saying it can. I'm saying, if it is the Lord... Let's just be sure who said it. Do you understand that? Whenever you hear anything, just go back and confirm who said it. If it's the Lord, it happens when? Now! With God, it is now. It is instant. It's not tomorrow. If it's not now, then patience has taken permission.
Patience has taken, asked for permission to delay it. Why? Because the receiver of the promise must match the promise. Amen. That's the reason why when you're waiting, there's the right attitude in waiting. Why? Because you know. Listen, this is what I'm saying. When God makes promises, right? And it seems to delay. It only seems to delay. Did you get it? When the Lord makes you a promise and it seems to delay, it only seems to delay. Let's, let's, let's close. It was sort of a peaceful night. And I like it. Don't you like it? You know, one way to know that delay is never a mistake. It's always designed. It's permitted. It's precise. How many of you noticed that Moses went up the mountain, right? And what did the people say? Moses delayed to return. And what happened? What did his what did the delay do? The Bible said they they went a whoring. Why? Because Moses delayed. And what did that delay reveal? Patience revealed a flaw in their framework of belief. Do you understand that? Do you understand that? you would have assumed that with the kind of things God did for them. I mean, they should swear. <laughs> right? They should just look at God and say, God, whether you like it or not, right? I have no other God but I have no other God but Why? You have done what no man Say it one more time. I have no Say it. I have no other God. And as you say it, your options die. You have done what no man. And, and that simple delay revealed the flaw in, in their belief system. All of a sudden, even they realized, right? 
that we thought we really believed. That's what patience does. Patience would come in and what he wants to do, every crack, every possible crack, it finds it. It breaks it. Because, listen, the Holy Ghost said to me this morning, you know, while I had my bath, the Holy Ghost said to me that if the Lord comes to fix anything, he breaks it first before he properly fixes it. Breaks it first, then he properly fixes it. <laughs> so, you know, you know, we, we have said those kind of things, Pastor Rampi. We stood and said, Lord, what have I not done? Give me the billions. I have prayed. I have even sown seeds. I have tried. I have proven to you that money can never take my heart from you. <laughs> you see, David stood and said, Lord, search my heart. Right? He says, if there be a way hidden from my eyes, So I know how many times you've stood and said to the Lord, Lord, I, I feel I'm ready. What are we talking about? Give me the nations and I'll make you proud. Put my name on billboards and I'll make you proud. And listen, the Lord desperately wants to. I told you, the Lord desperately wants to be revealed. The problem is how. The problem is the cost of revelation. And patience looks at your heart. And patience is a tiny crack. Is that one, one billion? What one billion will bring out of him? <laughs> the crack, it will tear. It will become a chasm. And patience will say, Lord, please just give me one more year. Let me dig around it again. Let me add some manure, add some water. Let me add some more word. There's a fullness that it needs to. I know he has it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Listen, there's a, there's a tiny line where a man feels I have it. And yet God is saying, take more. Do you get what I'm saying? Listen, I'm not saying you don't have faith. I'm just saying more faith. That's what we're saying. Elijah said, angel, sir, I have eaten. I am full. The angel said, the journey is, Elijah, find a way to eat some more. Elijah said, okay, sat down. And somehow, when he began to eat, he found out there was... After he was done, he said, ha, oh, ha, angel, this time around, I mean it. I'm done. The angel said, sir, the journey is look for space. Eat again. Listen, I know you read your Bible cover to cover while you wait. Read it again. I know you have prayed, yeah? You have prayed. You've tarried. You've told the Lord how you meant it. Right? While you wait, pray again. I know you've sown your seeds. I know you've given. You've given, you've given again and again. But listen, while you wait, give again. Give again. Fullness is what we are talking about. What are we talking about? Fullness. Samuel, sir. Samuel. You know, have you noticed? Once again, I'm telling you, have you noticed it? Kill in scripture. Pastor Hide, Saul went after he had defeated the armies that the Lord sent him to do. He had done, obeyed the Lord. He returned. So Samuel said, wait for me. I'll come and do the sacrifice. Saul stood there. After day one, Samuel didn't come. Day two, Samuel didn't come. Day three, Samuel didn't come. Day four, Samuel didn't come. Where at day six, 
The army got tired. Some of them said, you know what, this Samuel is not coming. Let's go home. They started to scatter. They are dispersing. They were leaving. Samuel, where are you? Saul was waiting. Saul, day seven, Samuel didn't come. Eight, Samuel didn't come. Nine, Samuel, ten, Samuel didn't come. Then Saul said, you know what? Saul is not coming. Samuel is not coming. Everybody is scattering. They are all leaving me. Soon enough, everybody will disappear. Give me the knife. He took the knife. Did this. The Bible says, immediately he finished. Samuel appeared. Someone say, say to your neighbor, patience is testing you. Say to the other, delay is a test. And I pray for you that you will find the grace to pass delay's test. The Bible says when patience is done with her work, you will be entire, complete, lacking. What a manner of man. Entire, complete, lacking, nothing. I Listen, a man can be entire, but he has to pass delay's test. He will be tested by delay. But I pray for you that when delay tests you, when patience comes in between you and your promise, that you will pass her test. You will wait until the end. You will wait until fullness. Habakkuk 2. Let's pray there. The ten virgins. The Bible said they waited, they waited. It seems as if he wasn't coming. The moment they left to go and buy oil, <laughs> he came. <laughs> Doesn't it look sinister? As if he's waiting for when you will just say, you know what? I give up. Ah, find grace to wait till the end. You will wait, huh? Unto fullness. Habakkuk 2. Listen to what it says. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and I will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Verse 2. And the, and the Lord answered me and said, write the vision. Make it plain upon tablets that he may run that readeth it. Verse 3. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. Say with me, God makes all things beautiful in their time. The beauty is that patience is done. The promise is come. You are perfect. You are in the promise. That is what God calls beautiful. And no one misses the appointment. Because you are not the keeper of that appointment. The Lord is. The Lord is. The Lord is the keeper of that appointment. Just do it tarries. Do what? Do it tarries. Do what? Then listen to what it says. Do it tarries. Wait for it. Because it will. Then it now said it will. Who are you confusing? <laughs> So what do you say? Though it delays, wait for it. It is not a delay. Say with me, it's not a delay. Patience is working. Patience is working. Patience is working. Say, while I wait, I cooperate with patience. We finish the work. We arrive at fullness. We arrive at perfection. Oh my God, bless the name of the Lord. You found grace tonight, I tell you. Found grace. <laughs> we have found grace tonight. Grace to wait until. And we wait how? We wait patiently. While I wait, I give patience room to finish her work. I'm not going to frustrate her. I'm not going to frustrate her. When patience dares to come in between me and the promise, it is for the sake of perfection. It is not for delay. It is for what? Perfection. Not for delay. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord tonight. Bless the Lord tonight. Bless him. Ooh, sky. Ooh, sky. 
As Papa, please go. <laughs> I will wait upon the Lord in His presence. I abide. I will call upon his name and I will wait. I will call upon his name and I will wait. Say it again. I will wait upon the Lord. In his presence I abide. I will call upon his name and I will wait. I will call upon his name and I will wait. Say it with me. I will wait. I will wait. In his presence I abide. I will call upon his name. And I will wait. I will call upon his name. And I will wait. Tonight, can we acknowledge that there are no delays in our lives? It's only patience working. There are no delays in my life. It's just patience working. <laughs> Say, there are no delays in my life. It's just patience working. Say it so that you rest, right? You just relax. Oh, it's a working of perfection. There are no delays in my life. It's only patience working. have come to the end of today's sermon. You can listen to more sermons from www.pastorchintok.com or listen to our teaching podcast from Google, Apple and Spotify podcast services using the channel The GLA Podcast. You can also follow live services on www.mixlr.com slash the GLAJ.